us. We've got a, a star-studded panel here. I think uh, Ken set the table very well on the statistics uh, related to MA plans and where we're going. Um, one additional statistic I wanted to share was the number of plans that are offering um, the in-home support services. The number was about 200, a little over 200 plans in 2020, and now it's close to 1,100 plans. So just an additional data point to demonstrate you know, where we're all headed. Um, with that said, uh, you know, there's some issues. And so we've got a couple of early adopters here um, who have been involved for quite some time. Uh, Brent from the home health perspective and Shelly from primarily, I'll say primarily because I know you do home health as well, uh, the personal care perspective. So will you all share, we'll start with uh, you Brent, share a little bit about your organization, how you got involved um, with MA plans and, and just tell us a little bit about Front Point Health. Great. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, Brent Corti, I uh, am Seattle based and Kansas native. I never get through anything without sharing that, so you'll be uh, woefully probably uh, surprised at how basic I can, I can keep things, uh, being from the state of Kansas. If there's any other Kansans in here, I have a ton of respect for you, and somehow we've, we've made it uh, as, far as, as far as we've ended up making it. I um, work in North Texas, uh, where we purchased our first company uh, called, uh, called One Point Home Health. Uh, Front Point is a, an MA-focused uh, uh, home health organization that is trying to push and disrupt the, uh, the industry um, and care in any MSA where we, where we provide care from really from the ground up. The idea is, is quite simple that uh, we have a, a, a group of providers out there, all, really all of us that provide home health that are seeking to uh, find as many Medicares as we can and to, to keep the, the metaphor that I use is to, is to keep grabbing um, fruit from the tree and, and eventually I think the fruit's gonna, uh, gonna stop uh, coming off the Medicare tree. Uh, I don't think that there's a huge future for, uh, for, for Medicare and we look at the stats, we'll talk about stats as we go through. Uh, what Front Point is seeking to do is to build a cost structure, a, a care model, a model of efficiency that can accept and, and, um, and, and take excellent care of patients who are on Medicare Advantage. Now that doesn't involve uh, simply saying, uh, yes, we're going to be subservient to poor rates uh, or we're going to provide worse care. In fact, it's probably the exact opposite, but preparing for it, and I'm super excited to hear, uh, uh, for everyone to hear what Shelley's doing, this act of preparing and the act of how you sort of prepare your company from a cost structure perspective is really, really difficult and it's absolutely necessary right now. So uh, that's uh, uh, Front Point Health in a, in a nutshell. 2,300 patients right now on the home health front plus two hospices, one in Houston, one in, in Dallas, and, um, and a lot of time on, on airplanes and, uh, and a great group of people. Very good. Yeah. Shelley. Um, so Shelly Sun, I, I founded Bright Star Care 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. We do medical and non-medical care in the home, primarily through a franchise model. We're about 90% of our system-wide volume through franchisees, about 10% through company-owned. Um, we're joint commission accredited in all of our locations, so we'll focus on quality and nurse-led care in 39 states, 400 locations across the country. Um, and you know, we got really active with Medicare Advantage kind of way back in 2018, started procuring uh, consulting resources and an investment six figures per year uh, to really help us get prepared, not for a full pendulum sw uh, sh swing away from private care, but recognizing we're in the trust business and as more of our consumers want to utilize their Medicare Advantage benefit for their in-home support service hours as those increase with more plans, we need to be able to say yes and not charge them privately for something they otherwise could get through government. So uh, for us, it's been a gradual uh, journey of trying to learn and work with multiple different MA plans, uh, see who 
we work with best, who aligns with our core values, who aligns with our patient population, being able to transparently share data and make the intake process seamless for MA plans, starting with a trickle um, of 10 to 50 patients uh, somewhere in the 2019 to 2022 range. Um, and now we serviced 50,000 families in 2020 two across our entire brand, um, and up and through 2022, we've served um, over 3,300 Medicare Advantage um, enrollees. So it's still a small percentage of our business model, but uh, we have aspirations to have that get to be um, approximately 15% of our system-wide volume and clients served by 2025. What is it now? Um, 2.7%, okay. with a goal for 2023 of 4%. We've set very modest goals each year to really try to learn go back and help MA plans understand why they want to do more business with Bright Star Care and focus on the last couple of years, double digit rate increases that we've been successful in procuring. But I think you have to take the, the bad tasting medicine for a period of time to prove yourself invaluable, say yes, make it easy, have enough data to be relevant. Um, and that was the philosophy we've used of kind of essentially break even uh, for the first couple of years doing business with the MA plans, narrowing down the ones we want to do business with because we feel like they're good partners, their authorization process is streamlined, they pay their bills, they don't short pay. Um, and we've really leaned into our ability to say yes. Um, what we see right now is the data is not um, large enough to be able to show outcomes yet across Part C. We have published data studies with Avalier on Part A and B that we've been able to use to, to open up the rate conversation, but the number one thing we've seen is the ability to say yes and what's our fulfillment uh, uh, rate. And you know, as that's above 50% across all of the um, referrals into our network for Medicare Advantage, as we have really focused on making sure that for every two we can say yes to one and provide those hours, that's been very valuable to the MA plans we do business with. Hmm. You said 2.7 to 4.7. Zero. So f something like a 50% increase in one year. Those are 2.7 is a small percentage of revenue, but it's a huge increase in the amount of care you'll be providing. And you said 10% shortly thereafter. That's yeah. We've had a 12x increase in the number of MA um, patients we've taken care of year over year. So we continue that trajectory. Again, a small amount per location um, as that continues to grow. Awesome. Yeah. So will you share a little bit about the why for you? Why, why MA, we got a little background on, on when you got involved and what your percentage is? Yeah, yeah, we, um, so we, we it's in, uh, the, the, the history as to, as to why it happened, I'm, I'm trying to think what be, what, what's relevant here. Uh, most recently worked in a, in a health system based environment, so technically not a not-for-profit, a, a municipal corporation, uh, but, but faced it very much like a not-for-profit that kind of ran like a for-profit. Am I, am I, let me look at a couple of folks that actually have worked there before. I think that maybe they <laughs> agree with that. Um, work, work there currently, one. Um, and you just you saw this degradation of the percentage of Medicare uh, of, of Medicare patients. And, and, and a lot of it is that, that some of the folks in this room uh, work for organizations that are, are sophisticating around how to find more Medicare patients. We're gonna get better at selling, we're gonna have better relationships with health systems, we're going to find a way to make sure that absolutely no matter what, those few bad payers that we take, you guys all know what I'm about to say, there's, that those are going to translate into something like eight and a half out of 10 good payers, which are Medicare. And, and, and at some point we have to ask that the, the large companies are really, really good at it. And maybe, maybe a bit of a bold statement for a Monday morning, but hmm. I think you're, everyone's getting very good at something that's not going to even be around in 10 years. I, I, I think that being excellent at, at providing a, a care to Medicare patients when this when, when, when the future, which we know is, is imminent, I mean, it's, a, it's Medicare is an endangered species in terms of, uh, from a payer perspective. So what we do, we uh, found an organization that, that does it, 
And someone asked me, they, they, say, they say, how do you, how, how is it that this organization did it, the company that we partnered with? And I said, I think that's the wrong question. I think the question is really, are they doing it? And the answer is yes. And I was amazed too, and then I figured out how they're doing it, and uh, truth be told, um, I just talked to a couple friends and said, I'm not, not positive if I'm gonna make it through the day in San Diego because there's so much to do in Texas to try to figure out that it, it, it does, the, does continue to hone in on this model and make the model stronger. Um, I think they talked me into staying because it sounds pretty great to be here versus in Dallas. <laughs> Respect to those of you from Texas, you've got the second best barbecue in the United States. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but, but long, long, long story short, um, if we can f figure out a way to build an organization that has a cost structure and approach to care and efficiencies that don't mean that in 10 years we're going to have to look at our entire SGNA and say, you know what, we have to let go of 50% of our people to make money, that seems a lot better than, and you talk about, well, I'll hold off on the emeticist news, which to me is just, I can't wait to talk about that in a little bit, but. What are you going to do, right? I mean, and we, we, there will be it's going to be a very interesting day uh, learning about about how this is going to how we look at this. We have these companies that are just really, really good. These companies that understand how to provide great home health, how to have excellent uh, provide excellent care. Their stars are in line. They 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 figure out a way to integrate. But what happens when you have to take a forty percent haircut on revenue? And that's probably what's probably what's happening. What's going to happen, in my opinion. Will you share a little, we talked um, before about some modifications to the model, right, to be able to operate within that kind of system and with those reimbursement rates. What do you see as the difference? What changes have to be made? To the model of care, effectively, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, if, if, if we're going to be making something like, you know, in, in Texas, if you have, if you're making $120 on a skilled nursing visit, that's probably pretty good. And I bet you there's some folks from Texas out here that are, uh, that are, that are uh, like, oh man, they need to get better rates. Um, but still, let's, say, let's just even say $150. There, there's, there's no way that you're going to be able to adequately compensate a uh, physical therapist or, or, or an RN to provide that care and, 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 and wake up in the morning and think, I did a good job. I take, kept these folks out of the hospital. So in my mind, we're not going to, we're gonna pay people more. We're going to pay our clinicians more, but at the same time, figure out the sort of below the gross margin, uh, the SGNA piece, the cost structure piece, and how to support that. So that's what we're attacking. And we're also attacking efficiency and attacking process orientation in a very different way. And I'll, I'll, I think this is an important point. And then I don't know how this is going to land, but this is, this is, uh, this is what I'm seeing change. Episodic care makes a ton of sense. We know that PDGM is, in my mind, is pretty darn great, and they're pretty smart, it's a smart model. Um, in particular, compared to PPS. Uh, but episodic care allows for a lot of extemporization. Um, one could say clinical decision making, one could say, you know, it depends on how you wanna carve it up. But when you, when you say you can only have six visits and you still need to get to this point, it forces efficiency in a way. Economically, artificial economics, they force efficiency in a different way. And we've got to figure out how to do that, to, to do more with less. I know that's a, sort of a pithy statement, but it's, yeah. it's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. So make the case for us. We'll ask you, Shelly, start with you. So we're hearing poor reimbursement rates. Um, I've talked to a lot of you um, last night about um, on the personal care side, the hours, um, really, really short hours, and some have said that's even more difficult to deal with than the reimbursement rates, a, a two-hour um, shift or four-hour shift, um, and a long timeline, long life cycle. So what's the case for doing this in your mind on personal, personal care? 
I mean, I think it's a necessity. Um, those over the age of 65, some proportion of them are going to want to leverage this benefit, so we have to be able to say yes. We conducted a study um, about 2,000 consumers who were currently enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan that offered uh, the supplemental and home support hours. Um, and the great majority of them would only continue with a home care agency that took their Medicare Advantage benefit. And I think that's really what is going to transform the industry is where we you know, have historically used salespeople to call on hospitals to get discharges. I think your client acquisition process has changed. And I think Medicare Advantage, theoretically, is your client acquisition. And so if you have rates that are at least break even or slightly better, when you have a salesperson, you don't know if that salesperson is going to cover their costs. I now am not having to pay to have a salesperson go get this client, I'm having the client come to me and I'm at least getting rates adequate enough to, to, to cover um, the rates that I'm paying my caregiver. So I think that that's important. It, it is less than what I would make on a private pay consumer, but we're in an inflationary period of time and not all households have the budget to continue the same number of hours they had. And so how do you keep caregivers productive? You've got to fill that in um, with small numbers of hours here and there, and Medicare Advantage provides an ability to do that. I think our biggest learning has been that it's probably, by and large, a different workforce. Many caregivers want to work full time, and they only want to work for one agency. And if they can work for one agency and get 40 hours or so, instead of having to work at two or three to get 40 hours, they would prefer to do that. Um, that's probably not the same caregiver that's going to be best aligned with Medicare Advantage cases. You're probably more looking for those that are retired and just want 15, 20 hours a week, or those that have children in school um, and want to align their hours during the day around when their um, kids are in school. We have found great success maneuvering with families um, or Medicare Advantage enrollees around the times of the day that we have people. Um, no one can read anything or turn on the news and not hear about labor shortages. So I think educating the consumer about providing them great care, but we have windows of the day where we have availability of care. Um, and so I think we've tried to match up caregiver availability to still meet the, meet the needs of the client and say yes on the Medicare Advantage because they are shorter shifts and those are harder to fill with your traditional employee. I do think there is a different type of employee from a different background and different, you know, um, different needs and wants and desires that are really akin to a good fit for Medicare Advantage. And um, we've used our company-owned footprint to show that this can work. Um, you know, 18, 24 months ago, I had three company-owned locations. I now have over 30. Um, I used to have it in one state, I now have it in seven states. And so we've dramatically increased the footprint of company owned. I'm fortunate I still own 100% of my company. I think it'd be very diff difficult to do if I was PE backed because it's been large investments and it's been willingness to take rates that were subpar compared to the alternatives to invest, to then demonstrate with enough data and enough time, clients convert to private pay two to 5% of the time there are certain aspects and profiles of a consumer where you can make it happen more often than not. Um, and so we've done that learning. We've invested those, those monies over the last few years to learn more. And now we're able to share that with our franchisees from what we've learned in our company-owned footprint. We now are moving out to more states. And we do Medicare Advantage in 31 states on a, on a monthly basis. Yeah, one of them. Um one of the comments you made about a, it's a different kind of workforce. And I think it was um, Dave Tataro earlier in the, in the prior panel was talking about a lack of innovation sometimes in our industry. But what we are seeing, and I'm not going to say any names of the, the software vendors. I know some of them are here. I don't want to piss anybody off. Um, but uh, AI coming into the space and schedule optimization and really across platforms um, you know, at a, at a caregiver level, not necessarily at the provider level, to share caregivers back and forth and create the opportunities that they really want. So I think that's, um, you know, that's a, a well said point that, you know, there, there are going to be people that are looking for that kind of work and that kind of flexibility. It's just 
making sure that we've got the technology and the ability to, to, to match them up. Absolutely. Yeah, quick, quick comment on, Shelley, on what you said about uh, it, may not, it may not be the traditional, I think I wrote it down, the many caregivers want to work um, with, with one organization, et cetera. It, it, it may be that we have to seek out exactly opposite of that. The, what is the archetype of the, of the future uh, caregiver, the uh, nurses in home health, physical therapists, you, you name it. Who, who is that? Could, could they be working 312s at a hospital and get benefited? And we ended up, we ended up being able to hire staff without benefit burden. I mean, there's, there's, there's a compliment to that. And also, you, in theory, we could still be the, the preferred employer. If someone has two jobs, if they're moonlighting with us and they're darn good at their job, I, I'll, I'll take Baylor Scott and White's education. That's good stuff. You know, we, 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 they're, they're, they're learning a lot there. I don't think it's going to be as much fun as home health is, but that's up to them. Yeah. There's a lot of legal issues associated with that, but we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> I, I think I, think we'll I just cost another front day. point $100,000 in Angelo's. <laughs> yeah. So what do you see from the, the, the home health perspective, pros and cons? So, uh, yeah, I'm usually a glasses half full uh, type of person, but uh, cons in, in general in working with... Uh, Working with uh, Med Advantage, I mean, it's 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 pretty hard to it's pretty hard to look at it positively. There, there's there's obviously a, a, a huge gap of understanding. What what um, um, I was having a conversation a few minutes ago about about this concept that um, there's a dissonance relative to what a, what a, an insurance company understands about the care they provide and what they don't understand. Well, it, again, my perspective: if you're an insurance company, they have uh, four, there's 4,100 or so hospitals in the country, at least that, that may be an aged statistic. Most of their money goes to these hospitals or the primary care, or certainly pharmaceuticals. And, and they're, they're providing to these 4,000 hospitals $4,000 a day or something, whatever it is. In Tennessee, it's some amount. In Washington State, it's some amount. In Colorado, it's some amount. And and their, their gravity and their understanding has probably been highly sophisticated to this, this is just super complex environment. And they still don't understand home care. How is that possible? I mean, we, one, any of us could explain what home care is, what hospice is, or what home health is, uh, aside from naming convention issue, which I know Bill's been struggling with for quite a while, uh, that, that, uh, uh, in, in, in a few sentences. And we keep patients home. Why is it so darn hard for them to understand? Um, and, and what that translates to is that, hey, we'll pay you, front point, one point, $120 a visit. And, and to me, that's maddening. They could double that amount, and the ROI is absolutely there. So $250, $240 a visit, and we'll keep their patients home. We'll probably do a better job because we're going to be able to hire better people. I'm preaching to the choir on this. But to, to me, it's, um, it's confounding that, they, that, that, uh, that insurers aren't understanding it. And again, preaching to the choir that this is going to do absolutely nothing, so what are we going to do about it? Uh, obviously, it has everything to do with, with quality and scale. They care about stars, they, and they care about scale. So we have to be able to come to the table with the ability to try to move, um, to, to illustrate from a data perspective how we can truly move. Uh, Shelly's got some super cool data. I'm, I'm very envious of your, uh, of your, of your data suite. We're, our organization is trying. Our, our, one of our... Um, Moonshot goals is to be the most data-driven home health organization in the country. And, and what does that mean, right? Um, it means that in every decision we make, there's, 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 a patient, there's patient care, there's benefit to, uh, to the care model, there's a, there's a financial efficiency, and there's a way to, um, to full circle exp explain and tell our story in a way that only data, in, in a way that only data can. Um, I had one more point. Uh, about hospitals. Uh, oh, th th just this, th this, this idea that, that there's so many insurance companies. There's 34 Blue Cross, 34 licensed Blue Cross, Blue Shield, I don't know if you call them franchises or associations, okay, that carry the, carry the Blue Cross, Blue Shield name. So 34. Washington State has two, and they hate each other. <laughs> uh, 
how on earth are, are we are, are are we ever going to impress upon this industry unless it's uh, that, that they should be paying more for home health and uh, and for home care and uh, even for hospices VBID sort of takes foot if we can't get to to them on a community based uh, on a community basis so if we're a company that is medium sized and growing or we're if we're LHC if we're um, if we're a, a, a medicist, if we're a, these other organizations, it has to be done surgically. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's sniper, not bomb. It's it's there, there's there's an enormous amount of sophistication needed to sort of impress upon at the local level how uh, how it makes a difference. And I can tell you, I saw it at Evergreen Health. We pushed on one payer in particular and had rates that were better than uh, that were better than Medicare, significantly better than Medicare because it was fee for service. We could do quite a few visits. Mm -hmm. So it's there if, if you push on it. All right, Shelley, I've got a, a two-parter for you. <laughs> Neither question has to do with your favorite Run DMC song. Don't worry about <laughs> <Perfect>. that. Uh, <laughs> and this is, this is from the franchise perspective. And I know that there are several, several uh, folks out there that, that want the answer to this one. Um, one, conversions. Um, how successful are you to converting to family funded or, or, or private pay? Um, and two, adoption at the franchisee level. Um, what experience have you had there? How do you incentivize franchisees um, who may have a, a more of a short term view of profitability um, to take these kind of cases? Yeah, so on the, on the conversion side, I think what we've seen on average is we are servicing a Medicare Advantage enrollee for approximately two years before there is a private pay opportunity. They're utilizing under their benefit hours for two years. And so that's a long lead time to have um, leadership uh, to a franchise system um, and say, trust us. Um, that there will be some that convert. We are now starting to see some of those conversions, um, you know, between two and five percent, two years into the journey of an of an authorized enrollee in Medicare Advantage, beginning to use above their hours and pay privately to want to have the same caregiver come into into their home. Um, on the on the influencing a franchise system, I don't know that I could have done it without. Um, a willingness to put my money where my mouth is and expand my company-owned footprint and to show that I was willing to do the same things that cost me money um, alongside my franchisees doing the same and that you could do it and still um, improve profitability dollars even if percentages changed. Um, and so doing that at scale um, I think has been important. We did in 2020 or 2021 reduce down our royalty rate in half on Medicare Advantage benefit on business to show our franchisees we actually were leaning in and willing to forego you know, franchise or profit to incentivize them to kind of step into more Medicare Advantage. And I think that was helpful, um, less about the pennies that that would equate to on, a, on an hourly basis, but um, more so kind of how we thought about it philosophically. Um, and then I think we've really had to look at you know how important this is. This is to the brand, and be willing to, you know, take on the position that we don't have a choice to do this. And so we've redone all of our operations manuals. We've made, you know, taking certain national accounts be mandatory. And if they don't uh, service certain national accounts that are deemed to be our preferred partners, two within 60 days, three within a year we can forever and there forward give it to another franchisee or company owned in the market so that we can make sure that we can say yes. And that was, you know, it's been a two year um, uh, battle, um, but you know, we've won the war and it's, it's necessary for where the brand's gonna go in the, next, in the next few years. And I've done it, you know, not because of trying to grow the dollars. I mean, I got into this business because I was looking for care from my grandmother. And the last year I did hands-on care and gave showers to my future mother-in-law. And we lost her sadly to a, a battle with cancer at the end of the year. I mean, I still in my heart of hearts, I'm a caregiver, even though I'm an accountant by background. And I think we have a responsibility to increase the addressable market. I think our seniors des deserve great care in the home. And I think um, Medicare Advantage plans that are 
um, innovative enough to recognize that in-home support services um, is probably the best way to do that and bend the cost curve, particularly for your more complex patients and uh, multiple number of comorbidities, I think, that's, I think we can be a part of that solution. And so I've led through that with our franchise system. It hasn't been is easy, but when is leadership easy? When it's truly leadership. Um, Andrew from Humana this morning was saying that when it comes to reimbursement and renegotiation of contract, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not all about renegotiation. But I'm going to say, come on, Andrew. I don't know where you are, but come on. That's a big part of it. Um, so can you both talk a little bit about your success um, in renegotiating rates, um, what goes into that? You know, we've heard of issues where plans won't always accept your data. Uh, you mentioned, Shelley, that there's a, you know, a lot of data that you need, right, to, to really be able to prove up that you are different than some of the other providers. So what, what moves the needle on renegotiation? Yeah, so earlier I said stars and, uh, stars and scale. I think, I think that uh, there's probably some opinions out there where there may be another, another third item, hopefully starting with an S, that, that, can, um, that, that matters when you're at the table. Uh, we... Uh, we're right now just working for that in, in, the, in the Dallas, Fort Worth area. It's a, a, a highly fragmented market. I think there are seven hospices in the building where our home health is. So, which is, I, I think we, uh, um, those of us that provide care in Texas and, uh, as I understand it, LA and SoCal, where we are now, and of course, Florida, uh, that's uh, super challenging. And those, those aren't the only challenging areas. Um, so uh, how can we tell the story? I think the data comment, uh, Angelo, is a very good one. So, so many providers want to just look into what's the sort of what's the easiest data that they can find. So they want to get online and, you know, Google star ratings and they see this and that in particular patient satisfaction is, is in the rears by, by months and months and months. So the work that we've done since we've purchased our, the organizations we've purchased is just now starting to express itself from a patient sat perspective. We closed on August 31, so that's, that's maddening. So, so the data that they are making decisions off of is, is inherently old and the system is, uh, is rusty. And, and we, they have to rely on us for data and we have to be able to vet it and prove it and explain why, why it's good. Um, so, so certainly our, our uh, you know, from a strategically, this is a, I don't think we're, we're not, not giving away the playbook here. Mm. Um, the more scale we can, can provide, uh, the more Medicare Advantage patients we can take, the more we're going to be able to sit at the table and be able to, to push on rates. Because most folks in this room are not competing for them. You guys don't want these patients. Uh, uh, or, 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 or perhaps to be a little more forward, your company possibly can't handle them because of, because of a cost structure. And I know what that's like uh, most recently. Where I know where uh, uh, the cost structure of the organization I came from was, was because of collective bargaining and all sorts of reasons was prohibitive. So it made, made it very difficult to be able to take, uh, to take these patients. Um, and, and, it's, and it's funny, uh, a, a good friend said to me about an hour ago, how's life in the for-profit world? Um, and, uh, and, and I thought about that comment. I love the question. Uh, as a, as a for-profit company, a private equity backed company, we're trying to do what many of the not for profit companies are trying to do by virtue of saying, you know, okay, sure. We'll take these patients now. Well, we're doing it as a, as our primary modality, our primary, uh, focus, um, it will be interesting when we're, when we're at that table. We're, 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 we're not at the table with any payers right now, but I think, I think we, have a, we have, in particular, health systems are, are wondering what our next move is going to be. They're, uh, they're, they're knocking on our doors quite a bit. So. How about you, Shelley, your experience? And, and one um, little addition, we've talked a lot about um, uh, differentiating yourself for a plan. Will you also talk about um, how you select the plans that you work with. I know you've had an opportunity to work with a lot. There's some good and bad. How do you do that? Yeah, I just think, I think there's, a, um, there's a necessity to kind of make sure rates are covering our 
you know, loaded cost of paying our caregivers, right? Um, and we did that, but it was barely above break even, but slightly above break even. And I think it's a sucking it up for a couple years of those rates until you have enough data to go back and have a conversation. And the reality is the plans are gonna have more data about how you're doing compared to your competitors. But if you've done the right things, they know it. And so what, what we judge ourselves on is our fulfillment rate. And we know when we're dealing with the plans, that's an important thing for them as to, if they give us 10 referrals, do we take six out of the 10? Or do we take two out of the 10? Because if we're only taking two out of the 10, we're not that helpful. We're not really a partner. So what's our fulfillment rate? My hope will be in 2025 that we will have over 15,000 Medicare Advantage beneficiaries where we can then engage Avalier again in a data study. We did a Part A, Part B um, Medicare data study where we put all of our customers up into Avalier's system that had, has access to all the Part A and Part B claims data. And we showed that on average per consumer, we bent the cost curve $13,000 and up to $30,000 depending on the healthcare diagnoses. So we feel good that we can have a good database conversation. Medicare Advantage is just early, so there's not statistically enough data to have an outcomes-based conversation. Directionally, we can use our Avalier study to do that. Um, so I think that's where we're focused is trying to grow enough that by 2025 we have a, a relevant enough sample to re-engage Avalier in a Part C study um, that's different than the Part A and Part B study that we, that we conducted. And so we, do, we go through renegotiations now with our national account um, partners. We've had to learn which ones are giving us cases that really allow our caregivers to be top of license that are you know, ADLs versus housekeeping or lawn care um, that we've had our caregivers asked to do. And so you figure that out and the intake process gets more sophisticated and the authorization process gets more sophisticated. We handle the authorization for our franchisees on a national basis. Um, I think that's allowed us to scale this because I think that's a difficult skill set um, to do at any semblance of scale at the franchisee level, except for our largest multi-unit operators. And so we've built in those overhead costs in a centralized way, and I think that's allowed us to be successful, and arguably it makes it easier for the Medicare Advantage plan to deal with one group instead of 400. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Quick, quick comment on that. I, I thought, Michelle, you mentioned that earlier when we were chatting before a panel. How, how interesting that, in, in my mind, it, this level, level of sophistication is so local, right? And healthcare is local and disease process is similar but changes locally with um, uh, social determinants and you name it. Um, how interesting that your, your company takes, takes this very difficult and sort of probably using new muscles from a franchise perspective and brings it, uh, centralizes it nationally. I, I, think, I think for us, we're, we're hoping to keep it local uh, from a from an off perspective, and then have have uh, sort of a back end small army of folks that are able to sort of understand the idiosyncrasies of Blue Cross and Illinois, or you, you name it, wherever it is. Um, it, it speaks to the idea that I, I think the level of, the level of specificity needed to get to keep relationships strong with these plans is it it's local, but you're you're handling it in a way that's super logical. Care and um, hiring is very local. But if there are um, repeatable processes that are administrative in nature, it's probably going to be gathered more at scale in the franchisor headquarters. And being able to do that for our franchisees, we charge a different royalty rate on our national account business than we do on our locally procured business. So we have a mechanism to build in that overhead. We're still all in a you know, for-profit business um, as well. But I think it does make that easier for our franchisees that we are handling those things for them at scale on a nationalized basis. Makes a lot of sense. Um, we could be talking about this for hours. Fascinating stuff, but I want to provide the audience with an opportunity. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, Chris, if we have any questions from the audience, um, please, now's the time. I wanted to ask Shelley, from a franchisor perspective, um, being nationwide, do you find that it works better in certain cities and counties and towns with the reimbursement rates? Like they're 
better for lower income, minimum wage places like Texas or somewhere else than they would be for California. Are you finding that across your system or? I think, I think margins generally are similar, um, but where you pay lower, you, I, I think most of the MA plans have a graduated scale to kind of match. 25% um, of our MA business is between Florida and California. Um, but we are doing it in, you know, in 31 states. I'll cheat and look at my data. Um, the, I think top 16, top 16 states, yes, yeah, so top 16 states with um, in-home support service hours represent 63% of our Bright Star Care territories. So I think we, I have, you know, prioritized my national accounts team to provide national, regional, local support for our franchisees, but we could get after a lot of the volume, focusing on not the 39 states I'm in, but even just focusing on 16. The other 15 are happening, happening kind of as a trickle, but that's a pretty significant amount of our system that's focused in the top 16. I want to point out that, that Shelly showed up with a three by five note card, and Angelo and I have pages and pages <laughs> of stuff here. <laughs> Clearly a very organized and accounting perspective of mine. We have time for one more question right here. There's a question over here. Yeah, mine just went along with that. I was just wondering, Shelley, how much of that are you seeing in Texas? Because I'm not really seeing clients that are utilizing the MA plans, and I'm local to Houston. Yeah, Texas is one of our top 16, but it wasn't our top two. So we are doing Medicare Advantage business in Texas. That means uh, Shelley's stealing all the work. <laughs> Well, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Let's uh, round of applause for our panelists. Great job. Yeah.